Bless you, sir. Bless you. Uh, we will have announcements um, given by. The response of reading will be taken from uh, Psalms 47, 1 through 9. The first I'll read, the second you read, and so on and so forth. O clap, you hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord our God has He is the great King of all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us, and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us. God is going up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing ye praises with all understanding, last together. God reigns over the name, God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness, the princes of the people are gathered together. Ah. Uh... 
Uh, it gives me great, a great privilege and honor to present the speaker tonight, Madam God. Uh, he's my vice chair, he's a friend, uh, he's a good supporter. Um, I also, I, you know, I joke about <laughs> having a few years on him, although it doesn't seem like it. <laughs> although, I, you know, although I have known him for a very short time, I have come to respect him. He's an educator, um, not only in the secular realm, but also in the spiritual realm. He's a husband. He's a father. But most importantly, he's a man of God. <laughs> he has a sanction and an unction by God. And that's all it takes, saints, by God. I believe his testimony would be one thing that I desire of the Lord is to dwell in his house yeah. woo, and inquire in his temple and behold the beauty of our beautiful and wonderful Savior. Let's stand to our feet and greet the man of the hour, my friend, my supporter, evangelist D. Christopher Scott. Let's, Scott, let's greet him with a warm praise the Lord. We are the Lord tonight. You may have your seats in Jesus' name. Don't go anywhere, sister. The Spirit of the Lord brings life. The Spirit of the Lord brings life. The
Stand to your feet, stretch across the aisles. Grab somebody by the hand, leave no one untouched. The Lord is in his holy temple. And there's nothing that we can do if God doesn't anoint us. I want the bishop, Dr. Lani and Tamara, come lay hands on my back, please. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Lord, 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 Lord. I'm on assignment tonight. And it's critical that I have all of the strength and power that I need to minister this word. Can you say that? I want every head bowed and every heart praying. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's here that we're standing tonight in your presence. God asking for all the divine anointing from heaven. Put on the horn of oil on your servant's head this night. God, we ask you tonight to take over this service. Oh, God, any spirit that's trying to come against the ministering angel, God, we rebuke it right now. And God, we ask the power of synergy to move all throughout this temple. My God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, oh, God, build us up in our most holy faith. In the name of Jesus, break every to the pastor, our director, 
And then I have to give an answer to him. And I make no bones about saying I have to ask his permission. So we thank God for him and being so capable and a fine leader. We compliment each other well. Amen. Then I want to give honor to the woman whom God has deemed to be my covenant and the person of Evangelist Tiffany I. Scott. And you know what? I, she, by Pentecostal Assemblies of the World standards, will be only classified as minister. But she had me being the priest and the bishop of my home, I have ordained her the evangelist of my life. I told her today that I thank you for the way you take care of these children. Look at those young prophets. She takes care of them well. She doesn't have the soap operas on. She doesn't have the stories on. She doesn't have some of that other filth on the television. But she puts on the Christian videos for those children. And I am so grateful for, to you, Evangelist Scott. So the next time you see me write evangelist, don't change to the minister. All right. Because she is my evangelist and her life lives the life for her. It is in the 150th Psalm that the Lord has our word tonight. Then put your finger in 1 Peter to a 9. And then Acts 6, the 16th chapter. If you stay with me for a minute, we go into the mountaintop tonight. All right. And when I hear the pages being silent, I'll read. Read along with me, beginning at the fourth. Did I say 150th chapter? I meant the 150th Psalm. I want to be correct. We're not in chapters, but these are volumes divided into five major works. That's right. This being the last one. And we shall begin reading at the fourth verse. Everybody read with along with me. Praise him with the temporal and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Now skip down to verse number six and let's read that together. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Now turn in your Bibles to second. First Peter, excuse me, First Peter, the second chapter, <clears throat> and we're going to begin reading at that ninth verse. I want everybody reading. When you have it, say, I have it. Amen. Let's read together, but ye are a chosen generation. Read on. And holy nation, a peculiar people. Now turn in your Bibles to Acts, the 16th chapter. I, by no means is, is this a reflection of how long I'm going to be tonight. I just need to lay my case very, uh, very sound. <laughs> Let's read that 23rd verse through the 26th verse. And this is very important because this is where our text is coming out tonight. Let's read and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safe. Who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Number 26. And suddenly, Let the people of God say amen. amen. Would you just look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Your, deliverance your deliverance is in the praise. Uh, you may not understand it right now, but I want you to look at your other neighbor. Look at him eyeball to eyeball and say, neighbor, neighbor. your deliverance. as a result of this text 
It should be understood that the praise in the grand scheme of God's will plays a minimal part. The greatest part of one's life is not in his praise, but in his worship. Worship is the place that every saint should strive to maintain. Worship is the vehicle that takes you up into the holies of holies. Worship will take you where God dwells. Because God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The realm of the spirit of God is a place that sinners and some saints can't even get into. Because it requires a perpetual state of seeking and developing the mind of God. Can you say amen? amen. Just hold on for a few more seconds. We get ready to have some church in here. Most people can't find the time or they don't have the patience to get in the presence of the Lord. And if they do, if not properly maintained, it's difficult to get back into that place. This place is uncomfortable, uncomfortable because the Spirit of God is hovering all around. It's like talking to a person about a concern that you have, trying to get information from someone who takes a long time to express themselves and give simple accounts about specific issues. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Have you ever met people that just takes them a long time to tell you a small bit of information? And after you give the information, you say, it took you all that time to tell me that? This is exactly the way God deals with his worshipers who desire to be in his presence. Waiting on God to commune with you rarely involves a five minute meditation, can you say amen? Bishop, am I right about it? Waiting on God does not take just two seconds, five seconds. One has to wait before the Lord. Because Psalm 1 says, and on his law, does he meditate both day and night. You feel God hovering all around and you know that any time he could start speaking. So the atmosphere must be conducive for worship and your mind has to be focused to receive what the Lord has for you. The Lord speaks, then silence. You think he's done, only to find out that you only got half of the message. So you got to go back and consecrate yourself to get the other half, and this time it seems longer. Seeking this kind of communion with God takes immense patience in waiting for him to reveal himself. This is the preferred kind of relationship that we need to have with God. But who is really to, willing to wait for God to deal with them in such a way? Pentecostal historians have said that the great patriarch of the Pentecostal centers of the world, Bishop G.T. Haywood's office, had a place where people knew that he spent many hours in prayer. Even after he had been gone for some years, the imprints of his knees were still on the floor. It was through this kind of faithfulness in waiting on God that he received so many intense revelations of the oneness of the Godhead. And the many precious songs of our apostolic heritage, like I see a crimson stream of love, but blood prevails. The water way, and one of the greatest refrains of our heritage, the day of redemption is near. So for those persons who still want to have a relationship with God, but don't have the commitment or the patience to commune with God through worship, they develop a praise relationship. This type of relationship is weak in that it is secondary or inferior to worship. Are you with me? I need to lay my case very concisely. The worship experience is not relegated to the believer just out of the Holy Ghost. Contrary to mainstream opinion, receiving the Holy Ghost is only an induction into worship, but does not automatically make you a worshiper. Worship is only enhanced through relationship. This preferred kind of relationship with God requires that you draw near unto him in thought, will, and obedience. James writes it like this, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Worship allows you to get closer to God, and the closer you get to God, the more wretched. 
direction you see yourself. Y'all didn't hear me. The closer you get to God, if you have a true relationship with him, the more wretched you receive, see yourself. The litmus test of a saint who has frequent intimate experience with God is humbleness. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Humbleness. I'm not swayed when individuals speak about the marvelous exploits that they've done for God and the wondrous power that they have in his name. Any intimate encounter with God always results in conspicuous humility. Isaiah writes in the sixth chapter, in the year King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord. And later on as he deals with it, he writes, woe is me. The spirit in its full function can no, by no means be articulated by or described through mechanical functions of mortal capability and intellect. Do I need to say that again? The spirit in its full function can by no means be articulated by or described through mechanical functions of mortal capability or intellect. This is why many saints who have the Holy Ghost don't really know the full potential of the spirit on the inside of them. The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually desired. Saints of God, the limitations of God's power is as only as strong as your mind. It is God's intention to reveal himself so powerfully in the spirit that he is free because we don't desire the true fellowship of the spirit. Speaking in tongues and rolling off our pedigree of the fivefold gifts was not all God had for the New Testament church. If there be therefore any consolation of Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship in the spirit, if any bounds of mercy fulfill ye my charm, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Philippians 2 and 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ reveals the deep and hidden things of God. This is true worship, knowing that God is a spirit, and they that worship him, worships him in spirit and in truth. Although the scripture has its focus in the New Testament, worship in its root had its origin rigid in Hebrew. So the Greek interpretation is not in order. Worship in the Old Testament was greater in that it was an unrefined relationship between God and man. The Holy Ghost had not yet been imparted. So the Holy Ghost is the refiner of our relationship with God. Can you say amen? The, the law in the Old Testament was both judge and jury. In many instances, when sin was committed, it was a known fact that you had to die. Thank God for the Holy Ghost, because many of us would be dead right now. And when death did not occur as a result of sin, there came about a true affinity for the God who is rich in mercy. When he could have killed us, he showed mercy. Mercy comes, worship comes from the Hebrew word proskuneo, and it means to kiss like a dog licking a master's hand to prostrate oneself in homage. When you come before the Lord, you are naked before him. There is nothing that's hidden from God. That's why I have a problem with people who don't think that God sees what you're doing. You are Oh, y'all ain't gonna like me 
remember, we're going to shout out to Wiles. This carnality gave way to worship. Whenever there was sin in Israel, or when there was a victory won, the only way to come to God was through humility and spiritually naked. Because the law governed sin, and usually transgression of the law meant a physical death, whether by animal blood or by the loss of human life. Worship in its purest form is reverent. It's infallible. It's undiluted. It's perfect. And it's honest. When one worship fears, she lays everything out before the Lord. All of our sins and everything is open unto the Lord that he may hear us. To summarize worship into one phrase. Worship is the elevator or lifting of a worshiper out of his or her present situation into the presence of the Lord. Because in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand there are Please the name of our Lord. I'm glad we got some Bible scholars. The implications of worship would suggest that the believer can't possibly remain in a state of worship at all times. And this is true. And if you try to remain in a state of worship like some deep folks try, you will be obscure. You will be on the verge of fanaticism. Don't you know some fanatics? is subject to the prophet. If you remain in a true state of worship, you can go to work, you can function as a parent, bishop, you can function as a pastor, you can function as a husband, and Timothy, you can function as a wife. There is a space for worship, but not perpetually. Oh, y'all don't, y'all don't like me in here tonight. I'm laying this foundation because we go on somewhere. When we get to heaven, our only job for the remainder of eternity will be to worship Because young people, God called us because we're strong. And God called the 
possessed by the devil began to warn everybody in their past of their commission. It is important to know that the devil knows you are calling. He knows what you are anointed to do. Bishop, that's why we have so many obstacles and people trying to prevent us. Because the devil uses anybody that he can use to try to prevent us. But no weapon formed. It's important to know that the devil does not have a problem with your call. That's what you need to know. He don't have a problem with your calling. He only gets concerned when you're somewhere with your calling that will tear down his feet. Dr. London, if you were still in Spiritual wickedness in high places. It's blocking the praise. The praise cannot pitch 
Praying and saying. 
to come and to consecrate you. And after he comes, I'm sure he's going to 